Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Alessandra Torre. Hey, Alessandra, how are you doing? Hey, Maddie. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. It is my pleasure to have you here. To give our listeners and viewers a bit of background on you, Alessandra A.R. Torre is an award-winning New York Times bestselling author of 30 novels. She is self-published as well as traditionally published by Hachette, Harlequin, and Thomas and & Mercer. In addition to writing, Alessandra is the CEO of Authors AI and the co-founder of InkersCon. And I invited Alessandra on the podcast because I was looking through some of the great blog posts on the InkersCon website, and I found this one about how to craft great scene descriptions that I thought would be fun. We're going to be talking through a little exercise that you could actually do if you're at home with a book, but we will talk through it in a way that you don't need to be at home with a book. But as with all of these conversations, I always like to start out asking my guests, what did you see in the writing community or in your own writing that made you think that a conversation about great scene descriptions was a topic to address? Absolutely. And I really love this topic because I think it's something that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. But I work a lot with new authors and experienced authors in trying to, when we're creating the curriculum for InkersCon, and scene description seems to be that thing that a lot of authors get stuck on. And a lot of new authors especially feel awkward with it, or they don't really know how much to use, how much is too much. And I've really been dissecting my writing in the last few years, really, as I got more and more into instructing, I started dissecting my writing more. And and one thing that a lot of readers mention is that my books, it's like reading a movie. Or it's like they can see it happening in their head. But it's funny because I don't use a lot of description. And so I've really paid attention to how much description I use, what scenes I use more description on, what scenes I use less, and trying to break that down in a way that maybe another author could understand, but also so I can understand so that I know when I'm being maybe too heavy handed with it or in the early days, I was way too light handed with it, especially as I got near the end of the book and I would start getting excited like, oh my gosh, I'm almost done with this book and my scenes would get shorter and shorter and I would have less and less. And that oftentimes is really when you want description, you want to like soak into a moment and a happy ending and enjoy this feeling or this climactic action scene. And I was like racing through those scenes a mile a minute because I was just so excited that I was going to be able to type the end and be done with this book. So, so that, that has been my journey with scene description where I've gotten to where I am now. There were two questions that that made me think of. One is that, have you found that the amount of the Goldilocks balance of just the right amount of description varies by genre? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if we're talking certain genres have to be more descriptive, science fiction and fantasy often because part of also what readers love about those genres are these unique worlds that are so different from our own. So they don't have a, a way of knowing that this unique world is different from our own unless you describe it. So science fiction and fantasy oftentimes have to have more description. And that's something readers really enjoy. Historical fiction oftentimes has more description because you're, you have, you're painting, again, that world that we are typically not in. We're not in 1600s London. And literary fiction, oftentimes, where the crawdad sings, something like that is going is often more verbose when it comes to writing description. So it's just wherever you're at. And also, is this book nine in a series where the readers know this world and they don't need to be explained things? Or are you introducing them to something totally new? That's a great point about the series. And I was actually just having this conversation with someone else. And we were talking about it in terms of people. Like now the protagonist has shown up. It's book 100. And yeah. like, do you really have to say, you know, she put aside her tortoiseshell glasses and swept back her auburn hair or whatever, because that's going to feel tedious to someone who's written, you know, read the previous 99, but is necessary for the people person who's coming into the series at 100. And although I think of it immediately in terms of characters, the same is true of scenes. Like if you've, if the you always have the some scenes in the protagonist's home or something. How do you know how to balance that to accommodate both those readers, the new to the series and old readers? I think it depends. Like, and I haven't done this exercise with Game of Thrones, but now I'm going to now that we're having this conversation. Like Game of Thrones has some very like the first time you describe the throne, the actual like the famous throne that's on the movie poster or whatever. 
like that was described the first time. They're not describing that every time George R. R. Martin isn't describing that every time a character sits on it in the later books because it is assumed. So if you have a, a saga type book or Twilight where they're not coming in at book three or four, you can you can cheat, not cheat a lot, but you don't need to do that. If you have more like a babysitter's club book or a Sue Grafton novel or something like that, where people do just jump in and out um, of a book, I think I think you just don't need to be. And I feel this way about all books. I don't think you need to be obnoxious in your descriptions. <laughs> uh, like, I don't think you need to describe the angular features of her face. I don't think you ever need to describe that necessarily and unless this is like unless you're doing it in the first book and it's a it's something that matters. But for the most part, I think you can just be very subtle. And I don't think if they're jumping into book five, it really matters necessarily what main character's hair is or what she looks like. You can communicate things like she's thin or she's overweight or she's she's extremely tall in in different ways. And that's another, I, I should go read like the Reacher books um, later in this series. And I'm pretty sure that he's just going to be like, a character's like, man, you're a huge beast of a man instead of like, but I, but I also think readers are oftentimes blind to descriptions. And I was talking about this with dialogue the other day. Like he said, she said is the, the care, the readers don't even see those things. And the same is often true with if a reader has read a series they're, they'll just skim over the things that they already know. And, and I don't think that they're, they're bothered by, and they're certainly not going to set down a book over it. Also remember that readers don't have a great memory. So they very easily could have read five or six books since they read a book. So if you do describe the main character again, they will probably appreciate it. So I don't think it's a huge deal if you do do a, a small amount of description, but are light handed with it. Yeah. I think for scenes, and now I'm thinking settings particularly, like the protagonist's house, there's sometimes shorthand like she lived in a rancher or she lived in a, a row house or she lived in a colonial right. or whatever. And then people have a general sense of what that's going to be like. And maybe that's all you need them to have. You don't need them to know that it was a, a single story home with yeah. brick or something. But one thing that I've noticed, and I wish I could come up with a specific example, but I'm binging Michael Carita right now. And he is really good at at describing a scene, but then pulling out one stunning sensory yeah. experience, like smell, is the thing that strikes me. That he'll say he walked into the house and and he could there was some tang in the air as if somebody had just lit a match or something like that. Sorry, Michael, I'm making that up, but that kind of idea where it's some it's su something that you haven't heard before, so it strikes you and then it paints the bigger picture. And I realized that. When I'm thinking of scene description, I'm almost always thinking of visuals, but there's this whole lovely palette of other senses that you can use. Any advice on that front? Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned that. And that is often one of my tips that I talk about with descriptions and scene descriptions is you do have five senses. And if it's so, if you can vary those, what you use and picking a pivotal, what did I used to call it? I talk a lot about with clothing, like I will normally only describe what someone is wearing if it is like a landmark item in the book, right? Like it's Julia Roberts, red dress and pretty woman or something like that. Something that really matters or is going to stand out in the reader's head. But picking one detail and it can be like if you get in, if a guy gets in his cop car and he kicks like an old McDonald's cup out of the floorboard. OK, you immediately know like his entire car is like a pigsty, right? You yeah. don't have to go into how it smells or that there was trash piled here or there. You're like, okay, there's stuff in his floorboard and he's the driver. Like, this is a messy environment. And plus, I think you get a nice insight into him if he's kicking away a McDonald's cup versus a Starbucks cup versus a Pete's cup or... Yeah, or the Silverful K hot dog wrapper. It's like, okay, he's not... Like, this isn't a fine dining individual, right? Yep. Like, he's having what he can eat when he can eat. I love descriptions, like one item that does like three things, right? Like that mm -hmm. tells you about like his diet, the type of person he is, and also the state that this environment is in. So I think that's, and the fact that he's kicking it out of the way instead of like, oh, let me pick this up and put it somewhere that it belongs. Or if he just picks it up and tosses it in the back seat or something like yeah. that. 
Yeah, the way I get stuck with clothing when I'm picking out one thing. So as an example, I have a character who's a bodyguard in one of my books, and I wanted it to be clear he wasn't like a thuggish bodyguard. He was like he's wearing khakis, a button down shirt and a sport coat. He's wearing yeah. a sport coat so that's hide, hiding a shoulder holster. And I wanted him to, to be portrayed as a professional, not as a thug. But I found that if I said he walked into the room, he was he was wearing um, a sport coat and you could clearly see that he was wearing a shoulder holster or something like that. I'm always concerned that there's this moment in the reader's mind where they picture like they're waiting for the rest of the description. So right. now they're picturing someone only wearing a sport coat. And I think that's just because I'm so deep in it. I'm like, I'm reading at a level of detail that no other reader is ever going to read it at. But then I always think, I can't just say he was wearing a sport coat. Now I have to also clarify that he's wearing pants and a shirt, which is kind of silly. I What I do when I do that is I don't, I rarely ever say she was wearing or whatever. I just have her interact with her clothing or him yeah. or like the sport kit he was wearing was a little too warm for the room. But when he looked around, everyone else had their jackets on. So they kept his on or something like that. Yep. So yep. That, that way it is. I and I got to tell you, I'm a romance author initially. Now I write suspense mostly. But so we do a lot of undressing in our scenes. And it is so tedious because I was leaving <laughs> socks and shoes on like without realizing it because I just feel like, oh, the man took off his pants. Well, he really has to take off his shoes first. And yeah. then I would have couples engaging in activity, like, and the guy still got his socks on. I would read a review where the person was <laughs> like, oh my gosh, all I could think about during the scene was where I had his socks on. And so I was like, oh, so now I feel like I do this whole checklist of the, you know, and yeah. that really tedious to me. But I don't, again, I'm so I, I'm the same way with you on that regard. Well, that's a great point where, you have to balance the lo logistical accuracy. Like I was right. describing people taking clothes off a body, a dead body. And mm -hmm. I realized I had gotten the clothes like in the wrong order. So I had to go back. And it kind of made sense because I think as a reader, it's it's interesting to hear about how somebody would undress a dead body. But in the moment, if you're like writing a love scene and you have to remember about the socks, it's an interesting example of how do you balance logistical accuracy against taking people out oh, of the moment. Blowing everything down. Yeah. So yeah. now I think it's just like, while he undressed, she did this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or make it clear up front, he never wears socks. He always wears flip-flops, which are easy to kick off. Yeah. The other thing that I thought was interesting that you had mentioned before is you were saying that you find that the descriptions become less and less because you get to the end of your book and you're right. anxious to type the end. And I find that when I do a word count of all the scenes in my book, the ending scenes are always the shortest intentionally because it's it's suspense or a thriller. And so it like goes really speeding the pace. Yeah, speeding it up. And I'm cutting between two characters and things like that. And so in that case, I feel as if the closer you get to that climactic moment, then the more important it is that you're using the least possible words to convey what you want to convey. I think in general that's true, but I think that there are scenes in books where it's okay for the reader to be slowing down and, oh, I'm enjoying this description of the coffee bar, whatever. Any tips for how you balance that, the cadence of the descriptions you're providing? Yeah, and I love, you'll have to forgive me because I use food. Exam food is like the example I always use on things, but I was just recently, I did a class that was talking about um, storytelling. And for me, there are some scenes that are like potato chip scenes, like they're fast and salty and, you know, they taste good and you can eat them in five minutes and then you move on with your day, you know? And, and so some scenes are like that, like you just need this scene to get from point A to point B and it needs to be enjoyable, but it doesn't need to be like a production. And then you have some scenes that are more like casseroles, like they do they need to be fleshed out and they need to have inner narrative and dialogue and description and whatever and then you have scenes that are like feast like they're and in game of thrones the red wedding like that is like one of the most pivotal and if, if someone hasn't seen it it's just a, a humongously pivotal if if someone remembers one scene from game of thrones they're going to remember the red wedding and that scene needed a ton of build up it needs a ton of description it's going to take 20,000 words to tell that scene and it's it's going to aftermath it's going to have humongous aftermath so depending on what kind of scene you're writing 
And I think a book should have a variety. Like if it's going to have a feast, it probably only needs one feast. But that that change in the type of scenes that you're using is going to provide that interesting, like keep the reader on their toes and keep them from being bored. Because if you have three casserole scenes in a row, it's a little it's a little slow moving. So I think it depends just on what is this like an enjoyable climactic, like really my happy endings to my romance novels should have been more baked in. They should have been more enjoyable. The reader like finally got to this point that they've been trying to get to the whole book. And I was giving them a potato chip scene when I should have like let them enjoy and savor this moment, you know? So I think it depends on the genre and the individual story, how much and description is a is a big part of what makes that either a potato chip scene or a casserole or certainly a feast. And so I think as authors, we just have to look at each scene. And we do this without even thought, typically. Um, we we innately know um, how much it needs. And if something is, is short and it seems like you're rushing through it, adding description is oftentimes a way to flesh that out. But it also can will slow down the pace if you're not careful. And so normally in those situations, I just... And I often, throughout adding description, I, I will try to combine action and description. So, and and I will try to have my characters interact with their world. And that's how I'm explaining their world by them walking through a room or picking up a prop or something that that tells them about the description without just flat out describing what a room looks like. Yeah, I like that when you would apply that to the the clothing you don't say she was wearing you say she tossed off yeah, her like raincoat or something she's zipped up right yeah yeah if, mm -hmm. you had mentioned that when we're reading we absorb this without being very aware of it and it's interesting because i just had a episode with sasha black about the anatomy of a bestseller and we were talking about that idea of reading with intentionality reading as a study for craft and you give up some of the escapism benefit of reading, yeah. but you're gaining by learning from what you're absorbing. And so I think this would be a fun time to take a look at the exercise you recommend people do to refine yeah. their descriptions. And for each of these, maybe we can talk through like, what is your experience when people do this or when you yourself do this? What are you learning? So what we're talking about is if you aren't sure how much description to use or how little description to use or what is normal for your genre. Um, so the exercise that we're about to talk about will hopefully like clarify that and demystify it a little bit and give you a better idea if you're on the right track or if maybe you're outside the parameters of what is normal. Perfect. So you call out, as Sasha did, that you have to be willing to mark things up, mark up your books. After you get <laughs> over that. Don't be afraid to get messy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, Basically, the recommendation is you take the, the first book you've collected, you go to the first chapter and read the first scene, and then you rate on a scale of one to 10 how much you could envision the scene you're writing and how much you enjoyed and wanted to read on. Can you talk a little bit about just that aspect of it, yeah. like how weighing those two things plays out? Yeah. So first, if you're doing this exercise, I would suggest you get three or four books that are popular in your genre and specifically your subgenre if you can. And so, as Maddie said, so open up and read the first chapter and try not to read the first chapter in an intelligent way. Try to read the first chapter as a normal reader would as you would. So without remembering everything that we're going to be talking about in a minute, just try to sit down and just read it without thinking. And then at the end of reading that first chapter, rate it on what are the two things, how much you enjoyed it, um, how, how much you could envision the scene and then how yeah. much you enjoyed it and wanted to read on. Yeah, exactly. So was this a scene that really like came to life in your mind that you could just picture and and, and feel like you're a part of on a scale of one to 10? And also what your enjoyment was of this scene and whether you're interested in reading on. And the reason for this analysis is because sometimes you can really enjoy the scene and want to read on, but you don't feel like you were necessarily walking down the cobblestone steps. So it's the the purpose of this is to be like, oh, this scene really didn't, it wasn't in the necessarily key. like I was part of the scene, but I still really enjoyed it. So you do that exercise with ideally like three or four books. So uh, once you've done that exercise for the first book, first chapter, the first scene, then you're flipping to the middle and you're repeating the exercise. Now, why do you recommend that going from the beginning to the middle of the book? 
So because normally the first scene is like the hook scene. It's also the first scene where you're like, the reader is coming in totally cold, has no idea what characters, what environment they're entering in. So normally the first scene will often have more description than a middle scene or then an end scene. So in the middle scene, normally the reader knows about this world. They know what the characters look like. And granted, you're probably moving to different places, but there's oftentimes less description in a middle scene versus a beginning scene. And do you ever, I don't think this is specified in this exercise, but do you ever recommend doing that going to the end and doing the same? Yeah, exercise? yeah. If you have time, absolutely. Yeah, I would also go in and do it on an end scene. And you're going to have a different experience doing this exercise on an end scene if you read romance novels versus if you read a suspense, as we kind of talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's important that your three books are well-reviewed and popular books because we are using these books like as a case study. And also when you're flipping through, leave a, leave a bookmark, say the scenes you're reading, because in the following steps, we're going to do some more things with those scenes. So you want to be able to find them again. Okay. Yeah, I realized that that moving from the beginning to the middle made me think of another trip up that people can do is that sometimes, especially for a, a book later in a series, I won't think to mention something about a character until later. And then I realize, hopefully I catch these on a read through, that if I haven't mentioned that they have red hair until chapter 37, <laughs> and that's important in some way. Well, even if it's not important in some way, it's a drag because by that time, a new reader has gotten a picture in their mind of the character. And even if I describe them in a certain way in a previous book, they're not maybe going to remember or be aware of that. And it's jarring to be partway through and then get a description that really doesn't jibe with what you had been hearing before that. Well, and, and I, also, if you admit, like, let's say halfway through the book, you mentioned that they're allergic to shellfish or something like that. That also stands out in the reader's mind a lot more in the middle of the book than it does in the beginning when you're introducing a lot of different things about this character. And suddenly they're like, oh, is this a clue? Like, this is, is yeah. this something that's going to matter. So, yeah, it is, like you said, much more jarring and stands out more. That's true. If you're writing mystery and you're setting up red herrings, then there's a whole other consideration for descriptions about how much weight do you want the reader to take from the description, whether that's as a red herring or an actual clue. Mm -hmm. Just a quick break from the interview. Are you getting value from the podcast? Please consider supporting it and all the work I do at the Indie Author by becoming a patron. To pledge a monthly contribution, go to patreon.com forward slash the Indie Author or to make an occasional contribution, perhaps to indicate the value that a specific episode or resource provided to you on your creative voyage, scroll to the bottom of any page at theindieauthor.com and click buy me a coffee. And now back to the interview. So you've got one goes through this exercise with two or three other books. And then you go back to the first book and you highlight all the bits of description in those pages that you read. And you call out that this would be a character description, setting or place, senses we talked about, action, descriptive action, and and not not to stress over the decisions. So yes. I'm curious, why, so, why did you add that? Yeah, so you're actually going to get out like a highlighter, or if you don't have one, a pencil, and go through that same scene, that first opening scene, or if you're in the middle of the book or wherever, and go through and highlight anything that feels descriptive. And and I said, don't agonize over this because sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know if this is like it could be a line of dialogue where someone's like, put that kite down that you're like, I don't know if that's descriptive. It is like if you could see something in your head or it generates something like when in doubt, consider it descriptive. If you're even thinking that it might be descriptive, consider it descriptive. But this will also allow you to be like, oh, wow, I'm picking up description in a lot of different ways. It could be through dialogue. It could be. Maybe the majority of the act of the description you're seeing is through action. A waiter, and that's another thing, like a waiter moving through tables, is that, or the the characters are moving through tables and it's a tight fit, like in this restaurant. So that's an action, but you're painting a picture. You're able to see that and to, and to learn more about your environment. So go through those same scenes and and highlight all of the description, and then just just flip through that scene and be like, oh wow, like. 
30% of this is description? Is 50% of it description? Is like 2% of it description? Um, so you don't have to be, you don't have to count words, but just get a sense of like, oh, this is a description heavy scene or, oh, it, it's very little description. And then I do this, this analysis and it's not like highly technical. I'm just like, oh man. So this middle scene had very little description, but I had super high enjoyment level of it. Or if I looked at all of the opening scene, so, so you take that amount of description and then you compare it to the ratings that you gave this book when you were reading it just cold and you and you see what you see there and were the sometimes the books that you felt were the most that you were the most in that scene and you could really envision it the most had the least amount of description so then you need to go okay so what was it about the scene that even though there was a very small amount of description I really felt and normally it's they picked something really vivid, right? Or they highlighted, like Maddie said, they highlighted a, a sit and it was just so visceral that you were like, oh yeah, or I, or, or it's a familiar thing to a lot of us. We all know the sound of a train horn in the middle of the night or something like that. So, or we all have woken up in our bed in the middle of the night. You don't have to describe what a dark bedroom is like. Like we all know what a dark bedroom is like. So just kind of analyze that scene and look and, and see what, you end up pulling from that. And someone, again, who writes science fiction is going to have totally different scores and feedback and walk away with it from this exercise differently than someone who writes cozy mystery or fast-paced psychological thrillers. It makes me think that probably the most notable descriptions are the ones that are completely in line with an experience you've had. So I must have read in some book the line about it was like when you get your new, I may date myself by saying this, when you get your new sneakers in time for school and you put your new sneakers on for the first time. Like, I just remember that feeling being a little kid and getting the new sneakers and lacing them up oh, and how excited I was. I remember the smell of them. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I bought my sneakers. We would buy them like in the middle of the summer and I would not wear them until the first day of school and I was uh -huh. going to the closet and smell them. And I was, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't wait to wear the new sneakers. It was like, I don't, that was a huge deal because I only got one pair of sneakers a year. So that yeah. Was, that, was the, that was a huge deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think when people great. can pick those things that are really going to trigger, like obviously the, the sneaker thing has for us, or it's where it's jarring because it's so totally different. Like he, he pulled the shoes on, they were because they were so tight, but these were the shoes he had to wear for the rest of the year or something like that. No, no, no that uh, description goes against what each person's experience is. So I think you can tap into tap into either one of those for making really good descriptions. Yeah, I love that. I, I agree with you. I think I've, I've been learning more about like universal desires or universal fantasies. Not it's not a sexual thing. It's just like what what we enjoy as people, like we enjoy a happy ending, we enjoy chemistry between um, people and I think there are those core universal things that at least people in certain generations we all know like or we've all felt loneliness we've all felt embarrassed we've all felt hurt and so when you can tap into those things that a lot of people recognize that you can you can skim a little on the description or don't or or on the description of how you feel because because we know how that feels yeah the the other thing this is making me think of is the experience of reading, and I can't remember, probably just as well, I can't remember what book this was specifically, but it was a, a book I was really enjoying by an author I love. It was like a thriller mystery kind of thing, a road that was crossing a railroad track, but then on the other side, there was water, and somehow it was significant, like where all the actors arrived at the scene and from what direction. And I got so bogged down. I'm like, oh God, I thought I knew where the water was, but evidently I didn't. Now I have to go back and figure out where the water is. And I think that kind of the logistical description where you're, you're trying to move the reader through a physical space without having, giving them yeah. the experience that I was having in this case can be really tricky. Do you have any suggestions for that kind of scenario? Well, I would try to make it easier. Like, for example, if she could have had like, two roads merging or something like that. Um, but also our readers, especially if you write in the mystery suspense genre, our readers are continually trying to 
understand what they should be paying attention to, right? And and if you do go into logistic detail or high amount of detail on a certain thing, that tells the reader that this is important and you're going to need to know this later. And sometimes, especially newer authors, will go into detail because this is a topic that I as an author know a lot about. But the reader doesn't know that. The reader just is like, oh, this is something I need to understand. So the whole movie, they're remembering the entire layout of this character's house when that never matters. And if you do take your time explaining where this character's house is in relation to the town and a path that they take to work each day and, you know, that they always stop at the railroad tracks or something like that, some of those details are nice. Some of those details paint the picture. But you need to be careful because if you do go into the logistics, it, it takes up brain space in that reader's head. And then they fight to remember that. And especially if that ends up not even mattering, then it can it can be annoying to the reader, but it can also cause the reader to then not fully immerse themselves and enjoy the story because they're so busy trying to remember, you know. And I'll see this sometimes in my own books. I'll see highlighted passages that don't need to be highlighted. Like, it's not like it was a brilliant literary sentence that I wrote. And I realized like, oh, the reader thought that that mattered. And some, and sometimes it's good, like it was a red herring or it was something. And other times it's like, I don't even know why I even put that in there. Like that was, you know, I was, just, I, I was sure in my word count that session and I was starting to come for both. But I had a really complicated logistics thing. I would work to simplify it somehow. I learned that that was really needed. And you could draw a picture. You know what I mean? I mean, no, no reader is going to be irritated by, you know, by seed, especially if you're like, if one character is describing to another and they draw it on a piece of paper, the napkin, like a napkin in the restaurant, and you have a little sketch in the book. Oh, that's cool. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's not. And we can do that now with ebooks yeah. and everything. Audiobook, it's going to be a problem if, yeah. if, if that is the only way for that reader to understand. But if it's just supplementing what you are verbally saying, then, then it's good. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I do think, as I recall, there was some, like, the setup was significant. The setup was the key to solving sure. the murder. You, the, needed, right. you know, yeah. you, you couldn't see that railroad crossing from across the pond or whatever. But yeah, I think that the the map would have been super cool. And I also think that it would be a super cool description for a movie. Like once yeah. I sorted it all out, I could totally That's... picture it as a movie scene, like, you know, the car coming down the road toward the water. And it would have been very suspenseful. But in in that context, it was tedious to get through. Yeah. Avoid tedium when we... <laughs> oh, yeah. For our sake and for the reader's sake, sir. And I also just wanted to highlight what you were saying about the fact that I think what you were referring to is that if uh, someone's reading on a Kindle, maybe other e-readers too, but I think on a Kindle specifically, and, and they highlight something, then other readers can see what other readers have highlighted, right? Yeah. So, and it displays on your Amazon page, which has, which has hurt me in the past because it's like the twist. Oh, you know? yeah, like, yeah. Oh my gosh. And they highlight it and then it shows up like on my Amazon sales page. But the good news oh, is I don't... You know, someone who hasn't read the book doesn't realize that that's the twist. Right. It, it just seems like an odd, random statement. Like, you're my brother, you know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that the last part we've already discussed, the idea of looking at your enjoyment levels and visualization and how it might match or not match the amount of description. And I, I think that that was really important. Like, I enjoyed seeing that as the closing, that it wasn't like more description, better visualization, yeah. not necessarily. Yeah. And if you can find authors that do this really well, like if you read, if you do this exercise, this isn't like a short exercise. This will take you 20 or 30 minutes. But if you if you discover in the course of that, that this author, this book had low description, but I really felt like I was immersed in the plot and I really enjoyed it. Like that's a great author for you to read more of and read more of in is the way Sasha said, like an intelligent, analytical fashion where you're understanding why, like, what is it about this author and what is it about their writing that I feel like I'm in the scene, even though they aren't bogging it down with description. Because me as a reader, I dislike description. I dislike understanding that I'm reading description. You know right. what I mean? I don't yeah. want a paragraph of description. And you know who I think 
probably does as well, but it's been so long since I read it. It's Harry Potter. And I say that in her books are so long. So she might be real, um, real in depth with her descriptions, but she had to paint such a unique world. And I didn't feel when I was reading it like it, I was bogged down mm-hmm. with description. So either it was just so enjoyable and interesting that I didn't mind it, or uh, she did it in an intelligent, almost invisible way, where yeah. whereas the reader wasn't like, oh, I just read a whole page of description. Yeah. And then I suppose that one could do the same exercise with one's own book. Yeah. It's hard to say like, oh, this is enjoyable. And I felt like I was in it. But yeah, by all means, highlight and see how much description you actually use, because you might use more than you think, or you might use less than you think, or a scene that you would have thought was a really big climatic scene that you did spend a lot of time in. Maybe you didn't use a lot. And maybe it was because it was all familiar places and people. Um, but maybe it could use some more. Yeah. So great. Well, I love this exercise so much. And I would be very curious to hear if <laughs> listeners actually do this as a follow on to this episode, what they find and uh, if people can pop their comments in the YouTube uh, video for this interview. That would be super fun. But Alessandra, thank you so much for talking through that. Oh, I love the topic. It's it's a super fun topic. That dialogue, there's so many. I mean, I think every topic is a fun topic, <laughs> but, but description is something I'm learning a lot about. Just recently, I've learned a lot about and world building is something that I really didn't know a lot about that I'm learning more about. So yeah, so I loved having this conversation. Thank you for, for asking about it. Oh, it's my pleasure. And there's lots of great information I can say on the InkersCon blog, but please let everyone know where they can go to find more about you and InkersCon and all you do online. Absolutely. So if you're interested in my books, you can check out alessandratori.com. And I write romance and suspense novels. A.R. Tori is my suspense novels pen name. And when I'm not writing, majority of my time is spent at InkersCon. So InkersCon has a fantastic blog for authors. So and it's obviously a free blog. So you can explore a ton of different options there. And while you're on the site, if you want to check out our conference, you can jump right in and unlock 30 full length classes. Seven of them are craft classes. And then we have marketing, advertising, and business classes, as well as a ton of best selling author Q&As. There's just a huge amount of, of information that you can explore and have access to for six years. So that's our 2023 conference which is available now. And I think Maddie has a coupon you can use for it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really great to be here.